Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at NACDD, the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities, uh, for our webinar today, Innovation and Sustainability in Emergencies. I am Donna Meltzer, CEO of NACDD, and I am the moderator for today's webinar. I want to thank the Federal Emergency Management Agency's Office of Disability Integration and Coordination for partnering with us to hold this special event today. This webinar is part of our Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month, or DDAM, advocacy events. We have over 200 people expected to join today's discussion. Thank you again for all being here with us. We encourage questions for our speakers today. Please click the question and answer tab to type your question anytime during the webinar. We will do our best to answer as many questions as we can as time allows. The COVID-19 pandemic has altered the lives of Americans with intellectual and developmental disabilities on so many levels. As we all know by now, studies show that having an intellectual disability was the highest independent risk factor for contracting COVID-19 and was second only to age for COVID-19 related deaths. One study found that people with intellectual disabilities were six times more likely to die from COVID than other members of the population. These alarming statistics are often attributed to two things. The first is that many people with IDD were at higher risk due to exposure from direct care providers, reliance on public transportation, living in shared group homes and residential facilities, and had difficulties understanding and following COVID precautions, such as mask wearing, social distancing, and social distancing. People with IDD were also overlooked during emergency response. Systemic inequity in our healthcare systems led to uneven health outcomes, even that happens even in the best of times. During COVID, such as communication challenges, lack of access to vaccines and treatments, outright bias and discrimination in care likely led to preventable illness and deaths. Today, we are going to focus on the positive how three state councils on developmental disabilities worked with federal partners to create innovative solutions to address emergency threats to health for people with IDD because of COVID. Keep in mind that state developmental disabilities councils in every state and territory reported activities to address COVID. If you have any questions about activities in your state, I encourage you to contact NACDD or your state DD council after this webinar. We are grateful for these partnerships with federal agencies and hope to see them continue well after the pandemic so that we can achieve greater health equity in healthcare for people with IDD. It is now my pleasure and honor to introduce Linda Mistandria. Linda Mistandria serves as FEMA's Director of the Office of Disability Integration and Coordination, ODIC. Linda has spent the majority of her career as an attorney, concentrating her practice in disability law and civil rights, representing people with disabilities who have experienced discrimination in employment, housing, public accommodations, and government services and benefits. She has taught disability law and lectured on the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, and other disability laws nationwide. Her FEMA office, ODIC, leads the agency's commitment to equitable emergency management by integrating individuals with disabilities into all aspects of disaster preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. Linda has worked with NACDD over the course of two presidential administrations, her tenure showing a true reputation as a subject matter expert on inclusive emergency management practices. We are grateful to have had Linda for these last number of years to have her here today. And we have just learned that Linda is going to be leaving her post with FEMA soon. We congratulate you, Linda, on your new position and hope that we will be able to continue working with you in your new role. And we look forward to hearing more about it. Linda, I turn it over to you for some welcome remarks. Thank you so much, Donna. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with all of you this afternoon and to share some remarks with um, this wonderful group. I wanna just open by thanking you, Donna, and, and you, Erin, for 
putting this event together for your partnership, for your willingness to meet with me, to educate with, to educate me, to share your wisdom and knowledge over the last um, four, I guess, four and a half years now. And it's, it's just been so valuable for me and I'm just grateful for that and, and to have the chance to be here today. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and, you know, I appreciate the uh, folks from the Vermont and Idaho and Alabama councils who are on the panel today. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what you all have to say. Um, the partnerships like this have really enabled uh, ODIC and our staff to help people with disabilities at the state, local, tribal, and territorial levels um, during natural disasters, during the COVID pandemic over the last months and, and beyond. And just to touch very uh, to, uh, very quickly on my role in when I'm leaving FEMA, I will be still in this space. I will be the director of ADA compliance planning for the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning and very excited to put my uh, knowledge to use in the sort of built environment and infrastructure arena. And there's lots of work to do across Northern Illinois and I'm excited to, to move on to that. And uh, we'll, we'll miss all of the the folks that I've worked with here, but I'm hopeful that we will continue to be able to work together to improve the lives of people with disabilities. So um, moving on to the focus of today, really excited that we had the chance to partner um, between, with ODIC and NACDD on March's National Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month. Um, as you all know, uh, every month, every March rather, the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities and partners work together to create social media campaigns to highlight the many ways in which people with and without disabilities come together to form strong and diverse communities. And the campaign is raising awareness about the inclusion of people with developmental disabilities in all facets of community life, as well as raising awareness of the barriers that people with disabilities still face in connecting communities in which they live. And, and this year's theme, I think, is really pertinent. It's World's Imagine. And the world is changing as, you know, as we moved through the pandemic, as we move beyond the pandemic to this sort of endemic state. And as we examine sort of this place of intersectionality and intellectual and developmental disabilities, and, and as we look at how people with intellectual and developmental disabilities are living their lives, right? And continue to live more integrated, included uh, lives as, as part of a community instead of separate and apart. And uh, I think that's kind of a goal that we share in common between FEMA's ODIC and NACDD. It's really about getting people to that place of being able to live, work, and play alongside their neighbors and families and friends, right? Not in segregated, separate, or different settings, but being part of the fabric of the community and being an integral part of that fabric, right? And this, this theme to me really speaks to that. It's, you know, it, I think imagination to me, world's imagined means it's, it's boundless, right? We can take it wherever we want to go. And it's, it's what we do in making it, right? And exploring those ever-changing opportunities, the new opportunities that we have um, as, FEMA, as FEMA ODIC, as NACDD, as the various DD councils and other organizations and individuals represented here today, I think, that the, the, it's, it's a world of endless opportunity if we seize it. You know, and, I, and I think right now, given the focus of the administration on equity, right? Uh, I think we have even a stronger opportunity right now to really stretch to make those gains that we've looked to across the disability community for the past several years with equity at the forefront of the administration's focus and disability as we know being an integral part of that focus. I think we have a really 
unique opportunity to seize this moment to advance our agenda, to advance our initiatives, right? To improve the lives of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and other disabilities as well. And so I'm gonna turn it back a little bit back to the disaster discussion. So helping people before, during, and after disasters can look different, right? Depending on the community, it can, depending on the people that need assistance. And this is something that FEMA has really worked hard on is making sure that that equitable development and delivery of programs and services is always part of the discussion. And we've really had a chance to test that ability to deliver services in an equitable way the, the last few years as together we've dealt with the nationwide COVID pandemic. Our mission expanded, right, to a place that FEMA doesn't usually go. And we found ourselves supporting vaccine distribution efforts, vaccine clinics, testing sites, medical facilities, and all of the pieces and parts that were necessary to running the COVID response. And as those efforts sort of expanded, so did our efforts to make sure that we continued to be mindful of developing and delivering those programs in an equitable way when it came to people with disabilities. And FEMA's Disability Integration Advisors, our Regional Disability Integration Specialists, and our other staff really came together to help support people with disabilities, including people with intellectual and developmental disabilities who came to the vaccination centers, for example. We had disability integration staff and regional disability integration specialists who coordinated ongoing efforts across all of FEMA's 10 federal regions. We had advisors deployed to support wherever they were needed. And some of the things that we uh, learned, some of the things that we implemented, you know, really kind of putting that creativity to the test during that time was things like implementing an expedited guest experience. And this enabled people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, sensory disabilities to move quickly and efficiently through the vaccine center process. They didn't have to sit and wait. They didn't have to stand online, right? And that was tested, uh, I think, in, I'm not gonna say where because I'll screw it up, but it was tested, found to be effective, and then copied in other places. And then there were privacy areas created by disability integration advisors, again, to provide people with disabilities with less noise, with less foot traffic, um, to be able to, if they had to wait, to have you know, a place free of sensory distraction, right? Um, our disability integration advisors and staff trained volunteers and response staff on communicating with and helping people with disabilities, including those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We helped work to establish mobile vaccination units, taking vaccinations directly to communities, partnered with organizations in the community, like having a deaf vaccine day, having a partnership with a Center for Independent Living to vaccinate uh, people who were consumers at that center, and things like that happened on and on and on all over the country, right? And uh, served really as a model for how um, not only COVID response can work, but I think how disaster response in a more general way can work, right? And you know, the theme that you may sense running throughout all of this, right, is partnership and community collaboration. And these are critical during response, right? But this month, I think, you know, Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month is kind of an opportunity to highlight how critical it is for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, their families, friends, and communities to prepare for disaster as well. Now, we all know here today that disability intersects every demographic group, right? All ages, races, genders, national origins, and on and on. And disability can impact us in a variety of ways, right? Visible and invisible. And so for people with disabilities and their families, it's important for us to remember that no two are exactly alike and that individual circumstances need to be considered to effectively prepare for emergencies and disasters, right? And I know that you've heard these things before, but 
when it comes to preparedness, there's three basic tenets that you'll you'll find it uh, find on ready.gov and you'll hear many of us at FEMA sharing the information and I'm guessing many of you share this information when you're out there talking about this. Make a plan, build a kit and get informed, right? And it goes back to what I was just saying about being individually prepared, right? Knowing what you need for your unique circumstances because even two wheelchair users like me are not going to have the same needs. We have to know ourselves and our needs to know what sort of plan we need to make for ourselves, what we need to put in our kit. You know, I may need extra tires, tubes, and an air pump. Somebody else may need an iPad filled with activity or some headphones. And still somebody else may need extra batteries for hearing aids or another assistive technology device, right? So it's about knowing yourself, knowing your family, communicating with your family, right? And knowing the kinds of things that you and your family members with disabilities need, whether you have to shelter at home, evacuate, uh, go to, you know, go to a shelter, uh, evacuate, go to a hotel, wherever, whatever you're doing, knowing what works for you, your individual circumstances and your families, right? And all of that, again, is found at ready.gov, some great tools and information there that are easy to use and share. And uh, we encourage you to continue to do so to help um, the, the uh, constituents of your organizations and folks on the call today to prepare. And um, I'm gonna kind of loop back around to where I began. You know, we, we've kind of, touched on a lot in a very short time, and I want to turn it to the panel because that's who you're really here to hear from today. But I want to re-emphasize the most important thing about all of this, whether we're talking about preparedness, response, or recovery, the most important thing is partnership. None of us can do it alone, not a single individual, not a single family, not a single organization. We all need to lean on each other. We need to learn from each other. We need to support support each other. And in the space of emergency preparedness, response, and recovery, that need is especially profound because as we know, lives are at stake. And in the six and a half years that I've been with FEMA, the first two as a reservist disability integration advisor, and the last four and a half as the director of FEMA's ODIC, I've seen our partnerships build and develop at the local level, at the state and territorial level, and at the national level. We've been able to reach more people, touch more people, share the important messages about preparedness, share resources with each other to help people with disabilities, including those with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And NACDD and the DD network have been tremendous partners to us in building this network of individuals, families, and organizations who have now a better capacity to prepare for respond to and recover from disasters. It takes all of us working together at every level to build that capacity, to make sure no one is left behind, to forge relationships between the disability organizations and emergency managers and planners. And I'm so heartened to see those efforts continue to grow and blossom. As we come together to celebrate Developmental Disabilities Awareness Month, I want to recognize and celebrate those achievements. And I want to acknowledge there's always more to do. But finally, to reaffirm our and my commitment to being part of the solution to improving the lives of people with disabilities before, during, and after disasters. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of today's important discussion. Back to you, Donna. And thank you so much for those beautiful and, and spot on remarks. I, I don't know what we're going to do without you um, and this wonderful partnership. I, whoever replaces you, I, I hope they know that they're, they're stuck with NACDD because we have built this beautiful partnership um, that you spoke, speak so eloquently about. Um, and thank you for understanding our world imagined is boundless. And I, I feel that the partnerships we're talking about today and how DD councils have been partnering with not only FEMA, but with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, and with our, our federal funders, with the Administration for Community Living, to really build partnerships and to take on some work 
during this pandemic that was a little bit out of our typical zone. As, as you had mentioned, Linda, you know, we typically do systems change work. We don't provide direct supports and services, but it became necessary during this time. We know that COVID presented unique challenges to the IDD community because it wasn't easy to explain, to live through or communicate about. The stress of the pandemic also exposed those gaps in the healthcare delivery system that you just spoke about. So that's what we're here to talk about today. How did we rise above that? What innovations did DD councils bring forward and how do we make them sustainable? So with that, I am going to introduce our panel. Today, we are so fortunate to have with us Daryl Powell, who is the executive director of the DD Council in Alabama. He's going to talk about vaccine uh, vaccination outreach and clinics that were uh, funded through ACL and the CDC. Following Daryl, we will have Christine Pisani, the executive director of the, uh, the Idaho DD Council. She's going to talk about work with FEMA with pop-up clinics. And then we will hear from Kirsten Murray. of the Vermont DD Council and Child Health and talk about special health care needs and long-term impacts as she has managed those. Oh, okay, I was kicked off of Zoom for a bit there. Um, Robin, where are we? And was my introduction of our three panelists heard? Donna, we heard the introduction. I think you're ready to introduce our first panelist. Terrific. Thank you so much. So Daryl Powell, um, although I see that the slides are up. Okay. We will begin with Daryl. Thank you so much. All right, well, thank you, Donna. Um, thank you for the opportunity. And I do want to um, apologize up front. I, yeah, I thought I had bypassed the pollen season, but all of a sudden it won't to bother me today um, out of all days. So if I, my eyes get a little worried, then I, you know, I apologize because it is bothering me a little bit today. Um, so we're excited and, and glad to, to be here and be involved um, with this, um, project today up front. I do want to kind of um, thank um, ACL, um, CDC, FEMA, as well as Donna and, and the group of staff at our National Association for the opportunity, because without this group, this project would not exist. So I do want to um, say thank you for giving us an opportunity and believing that our councils will be able to make an impact, which we have. Um, thank the staff, um, the great group of staff that we have as well as our networking partners and, and council members in our state because it has been a group effort. So we are excited and, and, and thank you. Um, and I guess we can go to the next slide. Okay, well, yeah, we, we've gone through that. So I do, like I say, thank you to everybody for all that we've done. Um, to kind of give you an idea of what we've done, um, you know, early on, uh, we, we first found out about um, the funds and the availability opportunity that we would have. The staff in Alabama, we met consistently to kind of brainstorm about the ideas and, and, and just things what we could possibly do. And um, after many, many meetings we've had, then we've consulted with our council members as well as our network and, and, and did several different um, verbal surveys to kind of see what ideas the council members had. Um, how can we better meet the needs of the community and best utilize the funds? And so we went on to establish marketing tools um, um, of how to reach the people throughout our state. Um, and, and there were several, several meetings. Um, we worked really, really hard with um, our Alabama Broadcasters Association and, um, and they really helped us get the word out um, throughout the state of Alabama. So <clears throat> through radio station, uh, TV ads, as well as YouTube channels. And as I reviewed some of my notes from last year, 
from September through November of 2021, our D network $25,000 investment yielded approximately $180,000 in airtime, more than $180,000 airtime across the state, which was a seven to one um, return on our cost, which was well above the three to one guarantee up front. So there again, we have made an impact through the marketing. Our council members met with potential collaborators, ratios, such as um, Culture City to just kind of discuss possible opportunities that we could have. Um, and then of course our council, we went on to form advisory committees with collaborations um, with agencies such as um, Alabama Department of Senior Services, uh, ADAP and UCED program, which is uh, part of our network, as well as Department of Public Health, um, Disability Rights and Resources and um, Access Alabama. So we really, really been working with these agencies and, and we will get into some of the numbers that we, we had in a little bit, but um, even with our designated state agency, Department of Mental Health, we met weekly and still meeting weekly as of this, to this day um, with a COVID work group to kind of access and, and work to meet the needs of the people in our state. Next slide, please. And, and of course, um, early on, our D network partners, we met on a monthly basis. Um, probably since the beginning of the pandemic, we increased our monthly meetings to biweekly in which uh, we addressed the needs of the people. Um, such as um, vaccine hesitancy. And of course, early on, we had a lot of issues with people just being hesitant to be vaccinated. So we really had to brainstorm, come up with ways, creative ways to educate the people um, um, about vaccine hesitancy. And of course, um, we had several people that really um, had the Tuskegee syph syphilis um, event in their mind. So people were misled with information. So we really had to educate and give people accurate ac um, information so that they could make an informed decision. So throughout our collaboration with other agencies, we developed campaign ads and toolkits that were placed at gas stations and dollar generals throughout the state of Alabama. And from July to August of 2021, through our collaboration, um, with other agencies, more than 2,000 calls in which assistance was provided um, to the people of Alabama was recorded. And as of, as of late last year, we recorded about 3,000 calls in which people asked questions regarding vaccines. So having people readily available to answer those questions for the people of Alabama was critical. And I think we did a great job to make sure those questions were answered. Um, as of last week, and of course, um, Department of Public Health really do a great job at, at keeping those numbers um, up to date. And they update the numbers, I think, twice a week. As of last week, Alabama had administered nearly 6 million um, doses, 500 million, 865,000 doses. And out of that amount, um, um, 2 million 850 some thousand individuals received at least one or more doses, which in, in a total of 2, 2 million 3,026 um, million completed the vaccine series. So I think through our campaign, we have made an impact in our state uh, and we're continuing to make an impact because those numbers continue to increase. And of course, early on, those numbers were not near as high as they are now in regards to vaccines. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, I mentioned campaign ads, and this is on your left-hand side, this is one of the ads that we, um, as a campaign uh, network, we were able to work with senior services and other partnering agencies to, to brainstorm and develop these ads. And of course, the ad on the, on the right is, is really an ad at work in the state of Alabama. As I mentioned earlier, um, they were the ads were placed at gas stations and Dollar Generals. And every time I've gone to a gas station or Dollar General and saw an ad, I would take a picture and, and email it or contact our council members as well as our network and say, look at our work. Because <laughs> it, it is something to be thankful and, and glad about because you see the work in action. So that's part of our work. I think the next slide. 
think we may be near the end. Yeah, I think that's it. I think hit it one more time. Yeah. Thank you for your attention. And I think that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Daryl, for sharing your work and all that you did around vaccine outreach in the state of Alabama. I now want to turn to Christine Pisani from Idaho to talk about her work with pop-up clinics. Thank you, Donna. Uh, and hello, everybody from Boise, Idaho. I want to thank you, Donna, for asking the Idaho Council to participate in this. And I'd like to thank uh, Linda for your leadership and uh, tenacity over the last few years and appreciate uh, all that you've done, um, especially through the pandemic. I wanna start by talking about the fact that the Idaho Council on Developmental Disability has been now working for about eight years and will continue with this new five-year plan that went into place October 1st on our targeted disparity, which is working with families uh, who are Spanish speaking from the Latino community here in Idaho. It's our largest minority population. And because of a lot of the work that we've done previously around asset-based community development, around cultural broker, around developing deep meaningful relationships with the Spanish speaking community, we have um, developed some significant relationships with two separate groups that are trusted community organizations for the Spanish speaking community. So those two organizations are the Idaho Community Council. They serve predominantly farm workers here in Idaho. And then another organization called uh, Centro de Comunidad y Justica. And uh, the two people that represent that organization, Irma, Morin is the executive director of the Idaho Community Council, and Sam Bird is the executive director of Centro de Comunidad y Justica. The two of them have, uh, we've developed substantial trust uh, by being in meetings, working together, showing up. And so when we were asked to participate in a group called the Inclusive Vaccine uh, Partnership, that was being headed up by our State Independent Living Council, we were very intentional in saying to them, we are not interested in doing that work unless we can do that work at the intersection of disability and the Latino community, which not only aligned with our targeted disparity, but also aligned with uh, the uh, high likelihood of that intersection of population becoming sick with COVID-19. Uh, that was uh, some intentional conversations that we had with the director of the State Independent Living Council before we started meeting. And once we did begin meeting, we were meeting weekly um, with a number of um, partners. And if you could go to the next slide. Um, here are all of the partners that we were working with. And uh, FEMA, Region 10, um, Linda, I want to let you know that Heather Biggers, Keith Mallard, and Gwendolyn Barron with FEMA um, were extraordinary. They came to every meeting. They provided exceptional guidance. They would go to the sites for us um, a lot of times to do assessments of the locations. They provided uh, cell coverage, cell phone coverage at some of our locations, which were very rural. Um, but you can see the amount of uh, broad stakeholders that were involved in these meetings weekly to plan and host five uh, separate pop-up clinics that we were committed to doing in rural communities at the intersection of disability and the Latino community. I also would like to recognize uh, my staff, Miguel Juarez, who um, was just an exceptional leader at helping to do this work he went to um, most all of the pop-up clinics. Um, it was he and I together, or sometimes it was just him one time, a few times it was just me. But the collaboration was truly amazing. And one of the things that we felt strongly about is that we not just offer vaccines. We wanted to create a, a connection to the community that was hopefully long-term. So that's why we also included the food bank. So we offered, uh, food boxes at every pop-up clinic. We offered gas cards for everyone that uh, 
received a vaccine and those gas cards were donated by local um, gas stations. We offered uh, books for children that were in Spanish. And uh, one of the unique things that happened, if you're a, a student of asset-based community development, you know that spending time in community means that you get to learn about community members. So I'll give you one example that helped the DD Council to build strong relationship in some of these rural communities that we would not have necessarily spent this amount of time in. So we spent time in Weezer, Idaho, which is a very rural farming community. And uh, it just so happened that we met a family there who was, uh, had two brothers with developmental disabilities who were being abused. And they had no idea of what services were available, who to talk to, what to do. So the council spent, we, we spent a lot of hours on the phone with the sister of these two brothers um, in order to assist them through navigating that process. And that just happened over and over because we happen to be in these communities at the time of the pop-up clinics. Um, one of the other things that was really instrumental was the Area Agency on Aging. They would send mailers to all the people that were in the Meals on Wheels program in Spanish and English to advertise the pop-up clinics. That was significant help. We also had uh, Spanish radio involved heavily uh, doing lots of radio ads. That was the number one driver to get our Spanish speaking community members out to these pop up, pop -up clinics. And then uh, we also had the Council for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing here in Idaho, who was very helpful. And the way it sort of worked for each pop up clinic, we either had public health come to, to administer the vaccines, or sometimes it made more sense for a private hospital, St. Alphonsus, to provide the vaccine. And they had a mobile clinic. And then there were other times that FEMA provided that um, vaccine outreach. So it just depended on the location, um, but everybody pulled together. All of these um, organizations were present at every single pop-up clinic. And uh, one of the pop-up clinics I would like to draw your attention to, if you could go to the next slide, is um, you'll notice this movie ticket in the middle of the screen. It's a yellow movie ticket and it was for a drive-in theater. And we did this um, as a sponsor to the Idaho Community Council. Again, this is an organization that predominantly serves our farm worker community. And um, their, that picture above the ticket is uh, Mary Lou Moreno, who is a council member, and Elba Escobedo, who is a, a board member on one of our independent living centers. Both are bilingual, and so they were able to help us um, pass out emergency go bags and talk to community members at the drive-in theater about vaccines. Um, St. Alphonsus provided the vaccine outreach at that particular pop-up, and we were able to provide information about disability and disability services and food boxes. Um, so the combination of pictures that you see here are represent the range of clinics that we did. And I would just say that um, the, the collaboration was extraordinary and the collaboration has extended to now create what we call the health equity work group. So um, the relationships built in these, what started as the vaccine, uh, inclusive vaccine partnerships um, really allowed the leadership of the two community organizations I spoke to, the Community Council of Idaho, as well as um, Centro de Comunidad, to really provide leadership about the disparities that those communities experienced and help other organizations, like many of our disability organizations, receive some education that was much needed about why this intersectional work was so important and why we had to do it. And so I have um, so much uh, respect. Irma is pictured in that middle picture on the left with Miguel Juarez there on the left. At, that's at our Shoshone Idaho pop-up clinic. Irma is the executive director of Idaho Community Council. And uh, I just can't thank FEMA enough for their uh, really providing an education to us, pr providing any type of service or support that we needed to get these off of the ground. 
And then just showing up um, and, and being with us in community to do this work was, was really extraordinary. And Linda, I just want to thank you um, for, for the staff that from Region 10 that were just extraordinary to work with. And um, that concludes my presentation and I'll turn my time over to Kristen. Thank you so much, Christina. A, a picture really does say a thousand words, right? It looks, uh, you can feel the excitement and the energy in your events. Thank you so much for sharing. Kirsten, I think we are ready to hear from you about the work that you have been doing in Vermont and uh, especially for children um, who are in need of vaccine and um, maybe some special care. Thank you so much, Donna. And I wanna thank you for the invitation to speak today and thank Linda for her opening remarks, um, as well as the Centers for Disease Control um, that provided some of this um, critical funding. Um, we could go to the next slide. Confident care for kids, VAX visits with less stress. What's that all about? Well, it's a program that we created with our partners um, that's based on the principles of universal design that provides training tools and resources to help create a truly inclusive vaccination experience for all children and youth, um, especially neurodiverse individuals with developmental disabilities or delays and or sensory sensitivities. And you can see on the left there some of the tools that we introduced people to, um, if, you know, all kinds of fidgets and things like that. I want you to notice Buzzy Bee down there in the in the bottom middle part. I'll talk about Buzzy Bee in a minute, but if we can go to the next slide. Um, so the council um, often acts as the, the glue that pulls projects together. And that was truly what we did this time. We pulled together um, people from the University of Vermont uh, Children's Hospital, a, a special program called Empower which did something similar to what we were hoping to do. It helped kids with sensory differences and developmental disabilities in inpatient settings to um, receive minor procedures. We pulled together um, ultimately 54 of the 75 clinics that were slated to uh, provide children with the COVID-19 vaccine. We pulled together the Vermont chapter of the American Association of Pediatrics we pulled in our Vermont USAID to do the research and evaluation of the project, as well as to blend and braid funding with our funding, since we didn't have quite enough to foot the bill. Um, pulled in Vermont's Department of Health and then our statewide family uh, support network. And what was exciting was the range of uh, roles and professions that we had, um, family advisors, a media specialist that was critical, occupational therapy, research, pediatrician, a family doctor. Um, many people in Vermont received their primary care from family doctors, it's very common. Nursing, child life specialists. We can jump to the next slide. Um, so um, components of confident care to kids for kids. Um, sound a little like what Linda shared with you. Make a, make a plan, build, build, a, 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 build a kit and get informed. So um, we provided a, a one hour training for uh, primary care providers and uh, who were willing to come and learn about um, different techniques that one can use to make the environment truly welcoming and inclusive. Uh, for children coming in to receive their first, uh, for their COVID-19 vaccines. So um, the training was based on the EMPOWER program that had already been operating in the hospital. And so we were able to pull in their child life specialist, a nurse and an occupational therapist, as well as a, a, a family with a child uh, with special health care needs. So that we were uh, walking the walk always and having uh, people with lived experience participating. Um, for providers who took the training and, and made their plans, we provided a, a, a substantial uh, bin of sensory tools, tip sheets that were laminated, um, sheets that offered children choices, um, some rewards for kids who were successful receiving their vaccine, um, and um, 
other other tools that could be used during the visit. Uh, for parents, we also provided um, a website chock full of information, checklists, and ways to prepare for your VAX visit. Um, and for kids, we had a, a downloadable social story so that they could color on the social story and, and could be personalized by their parent to help them anticipate what would happen on vaccine day. Next visit, uh, next slide, please. So this is just some of our promotional material. Hey, parents, make a plan for your child's sensory friendly COVID-19 vax visit. It was incredibly important for us to involve the media and a media specialist so that we ran um, um, ads like this through social media and um, as much as possible low cost uh, print media uh, to get the word out because we really you know, don't have one single button we can push that lets us reach all the parents of kids with special health care needs. So we needed to try to blanket the state with that. Next slide. Um, I'm going to fill in some, I'm, I'm seeing a, maybe a gap here. So I'm going to um, fill in a couple of things that aren't slided here. Um, so we started this by talking to families um, in focus groups, and that's how we built the program. And um, we did find that families were hesitant and confused about vaccine, that they uh, also very much wanted to go to their primary care provider rather than um, to a pharmacy or a um, school-based clinic. They, they thought that would be chaotic and very upsetting for their child. And um, we learned about the different things that families don't like about clinical settings, the lighting, the noise, the wait time. A lot of these Linda talked about too in some of the work that they've done. Um, the, um, the fact that um, you might be taken into a, a, a space that smells of, of, of um, you know, um, what they use to sanitize um, uh, clinical settings. All of those things can be triggering and upsetting for kids. So um, when we had gathered that information, that was how we put together um, the program. Um, I think I'm going to now come back to my slide and um, to talk about just our next steps. Um, we want to continue to promote confident care for kids. We are still in the process of getting our research and data collection. We wanted to be very careful not to stress our providers because our providers are very busy, have been throughout the COVID pandemic. So we didn't want to ask them to do extra stuff. So we had to work around that. And we'll be doing some surveys and other things to find out how many, um, how families responded to this opportunity. But what we really felt good about was we had 75% of the small practices across the state. And I can't emphasize the word small enough both for the state and the size of the practices, that um, you know, we were able to pull in 75% of them where, um, they, where uh, COVID-19 vaccines were gonna be, gonna be administered. So that to us was a, a big win. But we look at this as just the first step really because uh, clinical settings should be this welcoming for all types of vaccines and all types of minor procedures and well visits on top of that. We've been looking for an opportunity to bring more training around what I call disability core competencies to um, our uh, federally qualified health centers and to our other community clinics. So we saw this as just um, a great partnership that let us open the di dialogue up about what inclusive healthcare can really look like. And for that, I'm really grateful to the CDC and the administration for uh, community living. Thank, thank you. I wanted to leave some time for questions. So thank you, Kirsten. There is a question in the chat for you and it says, are the Vermont materials still available online? Yes, they are. And it would be the website for Vermont Family Network. And you will see all the tip sheets there and the downloadable social story, Vermont Family Network. Thank you for that. I think you also said you were going to tell us a little bit more about Buzzy B. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, so Buzzy B is a brilliant tool. Um, you saw the wings on Buzzy B are gel packed. So you put Buzzy B in the um, freezer. And then when a child is having a vaccination, 
you take the, the then kind of frozen buzzy bee and place it on their body, on their arm, somewhere between the injection site and their brain. And you now trick the brain into paying attention to this cold, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, enervated center on the, the arm that isn't the site where the injection is going to be. The brain is paying all attention to this cold. That's very interesting to the brain. You take Buzzy B away, you go ahead and give the shot, and the brain is still focused on the site where the cold pack had been placed. So um, I had not known that there was a non-pharmaceutical way to damp down pain, but there certainly is, and it's um, also really cute. So. <laughs> We loved sharing those with our providers. Thank you for sharing that information. Uh, there's a lot in the chat right now. We're saying I need a buzzy bee, just you know, <laughs> even for myself. I, I think that's so brilliant. Yeah. Um, so thank you for for sharing all of that, uh, Kristen. You did talk a little bit about um, how this program, this project that came out of this beautiful partnership, and it, it's an innovation that can be sustained. You said that this will move forward as, for every vaccine, for every visit that a child, particularly a child with yeah. special health care needs, um, may want or need. I'd love to hear if Christine or Daryl or both, I know we have very limited time, but it, do either of you have anything else that you wanted to share about moving forward? You've created this great innovation you did something that was in the moment and so needed. How does that look in the future? Is there relevance for this work to continue down the line? Daryl, looks like you're ready to share something. Oh yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, I was trying to stay in my lane. Um, I know Christine talked a little bit about the clinics, and um, we here we we we've got a clinic set up for this coming up weekend in one of our Black Belt counties, and. Um, we just setting up clinics throughout the state and, um, you know, we're just trying to make it happen. And I think the network, we, we've been on the phone, we've been communicating for the last two weeks to make this a success. And those areas that the, the, the vaccination rate is lower, we hit those areas first and then we spread out to the big areas. So we're going to continue to do great work here in the state. Um, a lot of people are on board. So we're just moving forward, making it happen in Alabama. Thank you, Daryl. Christine, did you have anything further that you wanted to share about where you'll go with your project? Well, just that we've transitioned to become this uh, health equity work group now, and our health equity work group continues to grow. Um, so now we have Native American representation. I mean, it, the word just got out and it just continues to grow. And so it's a network that is educating each other, but at the same time, making decisions about, okay, what are our next steps? as far as health equity issues. So um, that's kind of where the work is right now. And um, I think because of the work that we did, our partnerships are stronger and it's easier to reach out and understand each other um, to have common ground. So yes, both, uh, it, you, all three of you had an impressive list of partners that were shown on your, your sites, um, which tells me that this has very deep roots now into your communities. And I think you know some of the themes that have come through all of your work um, include not just building partnerships, but all of the intersectionality and the collaboration that each of you brought in partners um, that had distinct roles and brought different populations to the collective effort and that will live on. So mm -hmm. I congratulate all three of you. Thank you for sharing your amazing stories with all of us here today. I wanna remind everybody who's with us today. This is three of 56 state DD councils. All of them are doing amazing work. So um, please continue to reach out not only to these three, but again to other councils if you'd like to learn more about their work and how they've built such strong partnerships with our federal partners, FEMA, the CDC, and the Administration for Community Living. Again, I want to thank FEMA for inviting us to um, share together in this event for DD Awareness Month. Um, thank you for working with us to um, really imagine where our world is going to be in the future. We know we've been in some very dark and challenging times, very difficult times, but we're hopefully moving away from that. Um, and I love, Linda, how you said our, our opportunities are boundless, and we will keep that in mind as we move forward. 
Um, I see that there are no further questions in the chat, but of course, in the uh, days after this uh, presentation, if questions remain or anybody needs to talk about any of these issues, please do reach out to us at NACDD. Um, I want to thank Linda Mistandria again and her amazing staff who made all of this happen. Um, and to Kirsten, Daryl, and Christine, thank you for being with us. And thanks to all of you through our partners and our federal agencies and the DD community. Thanks to everybody who joined us here today. I hope this was helpful to you and you learned much. Thanks for being with us.